so we stopped. So what I'm going to do, I'm thinking, talking for about half an hour, and then we're going to go into room two 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 and um, and play around with the CI spaces too. Okay. Um, so where I stopped yesterday was talking about a, um, a study that was done um, by Sarah Krauss, one of her students, Sarah Carrie Rosenfeld, um, who's now at Intel, who's um, looking, who was looking at predicting the next move in a dialogue that a human may make. Because we're interested in agent supporting human um, reasoning, dialogue, and decision making. Um, and one of the things that they observed is that um, arguments that are within appropriate extensions, given the semantics that you've, you've decided upon, um, are not very good predictors of the next move in dialogue. Which, in many, in, in many, many ways, is unsurprising. Um, so this is the, the, the try, is the, the strategy of selecting on the basis of extensions. Because, I mean, even when we looked at proof dialogues, um, that the protocol was exploring the space as opposed to simply stating what you believe is, is, uh, is valid in um, giving the information. Um, and there is some, although um, thinking about classical argumentation theory um, and the various different semantics that we're looking at. Is, is not unusable and uninteresting in terms of supporting human reasoning. There's another study that, um, that um, one of my colleagues, Alice Toliolo, did looking at reasoning and how, um, how that aligns to human reasoning, which is a good indicator of those mechanisms actually being used to support that process. Before that, I wanted to um, touch on a few um, extensions to sort of the classic dong argumentation frameworks, um, but are attempting to capture um, more nuanced reasoning, in a sense, more nuanced sort of um, uh, representation of um, argument, with the aim really of moving towards more natural argument rather than being, being very abstract. But without having necessarily having the structure, but with the understanding that you can move um, from one to the other. So we have um, negative interactions between arguments within DOM. Um, and, um, and we've got from the proof dialogues the common knowledge that is necessary for sound and completeness within that context is a, um, a door argumentation frame. But it doesn't capture things like, well, um, joint attack on something. So two, two, um, two statements um, are necessary, two arguments are necessary in order to attack another. It doesn't look at um, preferences, support structures in terms of argument, um, and it doesn't really um, capture nuances of different types of strength of argument. Like that. And these often appear in, in dialogue and reasoning. Um, so um, what we want to do really is, is, to, is, to, is to support the individual participants. So, so this, is, this is our, our sort of unique um, focus for this, um, for this tutorial. Um, thinking about how we want to support the individual in um, issues like persuasion, we want to be able to capture things like our uncertainty about what the opponent knows, um, possibly how we can exploit gaps in their knowledge, possibly how we can put forward a number of arguments together in order to bring the, the dialogue to a more, more rapid conclusion because that, that's, I know, the most persuasive things for this particular individual. Um, thinking about the deliberation, we, we care about what others' preferences are um, and what might be their constraints, but we have uncertainty over those things. In terms of being a, a team member, 
in um, inquiry, for example, identify weaknesses or subtleties in interpretation, possibly what's known as linchpins, you know, what, are the, what are the arguments that are actually quite key to, uh, to, to the uh, debate we're looking at. Um, so if we're looking at supporting the team, how do we capture issues like, like different levels of belief of evidence that we get from different sources? Um, so there are various different mechanisms, as well. I noticed. One, one of them, um, one was um, uh, um, someone working with Simon Parsons, um, looking at joint attacks. So both A and B are necessary for C not to hold um, together. And of course, this is this is sort of, in a sense, slightly opening up an argument that's attacking C because um, these are. These can simply be, be annotated together, but it's, it's, it's giving a little bit more, sort of opening up the structure of the, of the arguments themselves. Um, um, Leila Amgord looked at preference based argumentation frameworks, really looking at things like how do we capture differences in terms of what, um, what we see as the reliability of witnesses, so recognizing the information that we're considering is coming from sources. Um, there are different claims being made, possibly contradictory claims being made by two witnesses, but I have to, I want to think about the reliability of those witnesses um, in order to think about what I should believe or what I what, what's more more most to believe in this situation. So she defined a preference relation over over arguments, um, which says it simply says that, that one argument is preferred to another. It's a partial um, process that is common within, within preference-based um, logics. Um, so A defeats B um, if and only if A attacks B and A is preferred. But we can we, we, with this. These, these two structures, the, the attacks relation and the preference, we can get into conflicts. Um, so we may have A attacks B, but B is preferred to A. So, so the, 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 um, what, what one witness says um, undercuts what another witness says. So there's an attack, not a, not, not, they're not mutually contradictory, an attack from A to B, but actually, um, witness the, the witness that has that has uh, that has given um, the argument B is much more reliable than the witness that's given argument A. So how do we resolve these sorts of conflicts? If we end up with well maybe they cancel each other out, um, but then she then she looks at mechanisms for repairing this to find some sort of um, reasonable coherence within these, these structures. Um, <clears throat> so, given those two relationships essentially between arguments, how do we resolve this to make um, an, an interpretation of the information we have most reasonable? Um, so, I, I look at things like the most preferred extension. Um, and uh, other people have looked at different types of preferences and have looked at Preferences over preferences. So, for example, why don't you look at preferences over preferences? So, for example, you might have um, a uh, in, in Ambul's work, um, he was looking at the reliability of witnesses. But there are other things that you might want to consider um, if you're looking at evidence. So, if you have evidence from multiple sources, yes, there's the the differences in the reliability of those sources, even if it's an ordinary. Um, but the evidence from one source might be three days old. The evidence from another source might be very up to date. Okay, if the, the most, so so um, recency might be um, an issue that I want to consider in terms of my preference over the evidence that I'm, I'm obtaining from different sources. Um, so a more recent update 
from a less reliable source might actually be preferred. So which of these preference relationships over the characteristics of the evidence that I've got is um, most suitable to the current situation? Um, so there's lots of, so, and, and that sort of ties into questions of look, reasoning about the provenance of the data that we've got, the how, the when, the where, the, 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 um, um, the who has who has provided this information. Um, and and um, unpack and, and again, it's sort of very similar to the unpacking in terms of joint attacks. Um, people looking at um, support structures. Um, so our, our South of France friends again, um, looking at bipolar argumentation frameworks, um, where attacks is explicit. Um, and of course, you talk, talk to many people in argumentation, and they'll say, ah, oh, support is just an attack on, on an attack. Um, and what's the point of do, what's, the, what's the point of looking at this? Um, but the, the, the aim is to sort of try to try to think about what's the most what's a good a natural way of capturing these, these, um, these argument structures at the abstract level um, in order to, uh, to reason about these sorts of things. Um, and Neil Oren um, has looked at this as well in his PhD thesis. Um, so he looked at evidential argumentation frameworks where you have this new, this sort of um, uh, source of this, this special argument that is the source of, um, of um, uh, evidential chains. So these are support links that, um, that, that ultimately support the argument C. Um, there is an evidential chain unspecified in terms of any, any detail that, um, that, that underpins D, um, but D attacks um, D, which is part of the evidential chain supporting C. So he explored this and looked at, um, uh, so, so th th there are arguments for um, this sort of structure actually being quite useful in terms of capturing arguments and, and, uh, and, and particularly in terms of interacting with, with, with humans. But then can we map them back into our well-known um, dual argumentation based semantics, and he did look at that um, he demonstrated that he could. Um, and there are various different sort of um, attacks in these, sort of, in these types of frameworks. So um, A attack in C, which is a supporter of B, is a secondary attack on, on, uh, on B, um, and other, other type types of structures that you can look at. Um, from a nat more natural argument perspective. Um, and the other one I wanted to touch on was another, which is um, probabilistic argumentation framework. Um, so then, um, after Nia went back to Aberdeen to become a lecturer, he and I supervised him and me doing other sort of um, work on argumentation frameworks looking at probabilistic structures. So what if you take a dual argumentation framework, um, classic sort of arguments of attacks here, I think we're saying it's done, it, I, I D, um, what, if, what if we have probabilities associated with arguments existing? Um, and this might be um, particularly useful if you're looking at modeling your opponent in some persuasion or other subtype of dialogue. Because you have you have uncertainty as to whether or not that other person knows about this argument or is aware of it, an attack from one argument to another. So this is the probability, essentially it's a, um, uh, the likelihood of an argument or an attack existing. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the interpretation? Well, if you've got an argumentation framework with A and B, um, if A and B have a likelihood of existing, if neither, if it just so happens that this, this unfair coin of A and B come up with 0.2 and 0.4, and neither of them exist, you've got the empty structure. 
um, you've got you've got possibil possibilities where there's just A, there's just B, and there's B. So um, this essentially maps into possible argumentation frameworks. Um, and oops, Semantics 
and things like probability surgeons. Um, so, so we we considered credulous preferred semantics mostly because that seemed to match what people were doing in terms of the uh, the more informal discussions we had with um, with these experts. So we had sort of round table. Um, uh, discussion with folks in NATO, looking at how they um, use reasoning, what sort of tools they use, how they capture the, the, the sorts of um, processes they go through in aggregating evidence from lots of different sources. Um, so that, that, that was the underlying motivation for using, using preferred semantics, and we're looking at um, credulous preferred semantics, so you have a number of different extensions. Um, and we may interpret the extension as, as um, a possible state of reality, um, given the information we have, the uncertainty in terms of the interpretation. So we looked at um, the probability of some set of arguments being, um, being accepted on the basis of, of um, the number of um, possible worlds in which that, that, that occurs. So the degree of belief that an argument is in the extension is, is some is just looking at the possible preferred extensions we have. Um, and then given, given some set of arguments, um, the justification ratio of conclusion um, just relates to those arguments um, within the set. And we're assuming that there are Um, so here's an example. We've got um, a bunch of arguments here, two preferred extensions. Um, if we look at, um, uh, for example, um, A2 and A3, so the arguments A2 and A3, which are essentially the primary point of, of uncertainty in this, um, in, in, in this model. Um, so this is the abstract, this is the, the, um, uh, the structured. Um, the, the light and justification ratio is 0.5, which is sort of intuitive because each of them is going to be in one of the extensions of the phone. And of course those things like um, the uh, um, A1, which is not attacked by anything, and A5 um, are going to be um, always true. Um, and we looked at um, also probability, looking at um, assuming that people take a frequentist approach to probability, there should be some relationship between the classic interpretation of probabilities in terms of possible worlds in which something is true, and a number of possible worlds, and the same in terms of extensions. So, okay, so the number of extensions in which some um, um, something is acceptable divided by the total number of exceptions. And, and, and extension, sorry. Um, so is there some relationship between these things? So we did an experiment of, of using a capital term, um, providing a number of different examples, very similar to the sorts of tech the, the sort of technique that Rosenfeld and Krauss used. Um, we gave a bunch of problems. Where, where people were, um, were asked to give a, give a judgment as to the extent to which some statement is likely to believe. So how much do you believe that Joe is a Republican? He's, he's a classic example of the Joe. Um, and we, looked, we also gave them scenarios where conclusions are probabilistically generated. Um, so we have lots of variation in terms of the the questions, the challenges that were given to each individual, and the order in which they were, they were provided. Um, so as, um, so this is a, they try to, to, to look at the, so at the top. These darker lines are, are extremely likely. So I believe um, that this statement is, is, is extremely likely. The amount of stuff, uh, the amount of, um, 
of weight down here is extremely unlikely, and the lighter band is the, I don't know, okay, so it's sort of trying to highlight where these things are in terms of the amount in likely, extremely likely, and the amount in, in unlikely and extremely likely. And as you're going across here, in terms of these different, different scenarios, the justification ratio or um, the probability increases. Okay? So is, um, looking, at, looking at this, the, as the justification ratio increases, people are more likely to agree with the conclusion. Um, yes, there are some weird things going on in the middle, um, but, um, but there is sort of a trend to, um, to more accepting in terms of the situation. Um, so, in terms of the believability, we have the same sort of pattern as the justification ratio um, likelihood of the fact increases, we end, we end up with more people agreeing with what's going on. So, there, there, there's a limited amount that we can draw from these experiments, and there are some things that simply were not significant, um, but um, the two, but certainly the two correlations um, in terms of the arguments and the probabilities, are similar, um, and um, and we can um, we 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 demonstrated that people tend to agree with the outcome of probabilistic semantics okay, and understand this sort of idea of probability in terms of the conclusion. Um, and there seems to be some sort of agreement between these two things. So why were we looking at that? We were looking at that because it's sort of, going back to, to, to this, this stuff that I started off with, we were trying to unpack and understand the, the extent to which um, the techniques that we were using um, underpinning this, um, these sort of argumentation-based analytics tools um, are reflecting human reasoning, and, um, and we have we had we, we done an evaluation study in terms of um, technology acceptance and some structured interviews with the with the analysts, um, but we wanted to sort of look more detail about in more detail about the um, uh, the reasoning process and whether it sort of matches to um, to general people um, human reason. So the tool itself, which is what we're going to play around with shortly, um, is designed to support the analyst in structuring evidence and identifying hypotheses. There are lots of tools out there, um, like Palantir and an Analyst Notebook, which are looking at trying to look at links between little bits of evidence from social media and whatever, um, and clustering techniques and visualization techniques, etc. What we wanted to do is to say, right, you've got some um, bundles of evidence that you have some sort of understanding of, or, so, or, or, or um, you've got reports from individuals that have aggregated these, the, the, these bits of evidence. What we want to do is to try to formulate and capture our reasoning and understand what sort of hypotheses are accepted or, um, um, or not. So this is an example. Um, so the, the, the question is to evaluate the, um, the Jupiter intervention on a conflict ongoing in Mars. So it's a completely um, imaginary situation. Um, so the hypothesis is that Jupiter intervention on Mars will um, we, 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 so is it humanitarian or strategical? Uh, and we're looking at, um, not looking at data, data gathering, but we're interested in the justification of possible hypotheses. So the tool is looking at um, um, reasoning about provenance, which is where the question of preferences over preferences comes in. Um, we, we utilize data from crowdsourcing um, in the original tool, but not in the current tool. Um, and we, we've got um, methods for, for interpreting some structured evidence. 
Um, so in terms of the structuring of reasoning, we use um, the argument schemes, such as those that I mentioned before. And cause to effect seems to be a very common argument scheme used in this context. Um, because what the analyst is trying to do is to construct a story that explains the situation and possibly predicts what's going to happen in the future. Um, so we have here um, an example where, where, where we're talking about the uh, that particular intervention on Mars. Um, Will, will either it will, it will protect strategic assets or it's humanitarian and those are mutually um, contradictory. Um, the agreement to exchange crude oil, crude oil for refined petroleum is, is, some, is, is a, um, an a sub-argument of the, of the strategic um, um, intervention. And we can build up other, other evidence on the basis of this, that saying, well, if, um, in terms of thinking about this, this intervention being humanitarian, the argument against this, uh, one argument against this, is that um, civilian ca casualties may be caused by this particular intervention on Mars. And um, because we're using certain techniques in terms of intervening. Um, and we can then ask further questions about these questions. And here is a, um, a, an argument from cause to effect. And this is a critical question that relates to that, that, um, uh, that um, argumentation scheme. And we can, and we, so the analyst builds up this, um, this um, map of the situation on the basis of uh, the, these, the, these sort of links and critical questions. So we end up with a, a knowledge base from this structuring of evidence, um, along with a number of different um, rules and um, representation of things that are contrary to other things. Um, and then from, so we can be taking that knowledge base uh, from the argument graph and then map it to um, a, uh, uh, an abstract argumentation structure, exactly the same way that we had before. Um, and on this basis, we can then, we, we can then use, use standard techniques. In fact, we use fairly Pensaluti's um, uh, satisfactory SAP-based um, mechanism, which is, which is very efficient in terms of preferred extension, which is what we wanted, in order to identify the, um, the appropriate skeptical or credulous preferred, um, preferred extensions from this, these structures. So then that maps back into the, the interface where, um, where these, the various different Things that are in or out, um, or accepted or, or not, are then flagged up, giving direct feedback to the user. Um, so what we're going to look at, and I think, I think really we ought to start looking at it now, otherwise we really won't have enough time, is an adaptation. So, so it was dark background and not very easy to see. That was the first version of the CI Spaces tool that we developed with um, with, with folks in, um, in Honeywell and UCLA. Um, we have extracted various different parts of that um, in, and built it up into a web-based tool because the plan is to actually make this freely available to people, not only as a tool, but also currently it's on GitHub so you can actually get it and install it and mess around with it. Uh, and branch it and add your stuff to it if you really want to. Um, so we have a web, we've developed a web-based tool um, through a small project that um, Alice Federico and I had um, and, some, and the help of some NSC students at Southampton doing some um, web interface work. Uh, 
um, to do precisely this sort of thing. So what we're going to do is go over to room 222, and if everyone takes one of these user guides before you go, and I'm going to put in, um, I'm going to put right down your username. So do you want to pick up and um, go to room 222? Oh, I'm aware that we have a, I'm running out of time, and we have a break at 11. But I, so those, those logins will, I, I'm not going to change them. Feel free to, to play around um, um, later in the week or whenever. Um, and, do, and do give me a shout if there's a problem um, and you want to sort of like, you know, get, a, get a new login um, or whatever. As I said, eventually we will get um, a system that's a little bit more uh, professional in the sense that you can change the password. You can sort of, you know, you could ask for a login and other things like that. So all the sort of standard stuff that you would expect of these sorts of services. And there's a, there's a load, load of other things that we have stripped out of, of this web-based version because we wanted to sort of re-engineer things to be a bit more robust. Um, but so from a, an argument representation perspective, the things that we looked at so we have have argument schemes and critical questions. So if you, um, if you, uh, I'll just log in as, uh, no, I've got a few there. So if I, if I have a look at this thing here, I've got a, an argument scheme from cause to effect here which is taking what is exactly the scenario that I've got on the last sheet. Um, Waterborne, so I'll just put a little slide at the bottom here. That, um, so waterborne bacteria are formed via sewage leakage, sewage leakage, blah, 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 blah. So there's a cause to effect, and I can ask a question um, Um, of this, given the argument scheme, um, things like is there evidence to know, is there a general rule, blah blah blah, all that, diff all those different um, critical questions, which will give me a question to answer. So, um, so we've got because we have this argument scheme here, there's a bunch of critical questions, and if I ask a critical question on that, it will give me another argument that attacks it which is the question that I can then answer. So, um, so, so we, we, we have argument schemes and critical questions which allow you to... Sorry. Can you come back on to the network question? Sure. Um, so, if in, in here, if I double click on this, this node, because it is a premise, yeah of an inference that's using a specific argument scheme, if this is the cause to effect argument scheme, then it um, picks up all the different critical questions that you can ask. Because I asked one of them, um, <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think one of them is, is no longer there, or should be there, no longer there. So I can ask a critical question, and um, it will give me, give me that. Um, so that's that, that's fine. We're using um, our, um, we're using AIF as a representation because it's what we what, what we've got as a uh, as a, as a, um, a, a shareable structure in terms of representing arguments. It has all the argument schemes and pieces like that. But we extended it. One of the things that we want to do is explore provenance and the provenance of the data that we're, that we're obtaining from external sources. So we 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 we, um, we link that in with, with the the, um, the standard provenance ontology, um, um, ProdM, ProdData model, which is a um, a W3C standard, 
and or recommendation as they call it. Um, so, so we can capture, formally capture provenance of the data that, or the, 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 the evidence that we have obtained from external sources. But one of the things we're also doing in the original tool, but now mapping it into the current tool, is to record the provenance of analysis. So, okay, the, the key thing there is because we want to support collaboration, so if Demo 1, or Fred, or whatever, has done something in terms of structuring the evidence, and then has passed it over to Alice or whoever, um, and they do something else, you're recording the provenance of what's gone on in terms of the analysis. Um, so, yeah, what's provenance? Provenance is, um, essentially, it's, it's formally recording what has happened, by, and who has done it, and what's the action? And so, so you've got this sort of, um, uh, and, and what did they use in order to do it? So it's sort of essentially the chain of what has happened to a thing in terms of mapping it from where it came from to where it is now. Um, and <clears throat> so in terms of user consumption, it's sort of both bipolar like graph, which seem to be the most natural way of capturing these sorts of structures. Um, we have um, uh, an aspect plus um, mapping, um, and we're using JR Semsat, which is uh, Federico's algorithm for um, computing extensions um, in, in a web service. So we essentially send the, the JSON to a web service. It's, it's converted into um, the appropriate format for the solver, and it comes back with the um, the uh, preferred extensions for us to display to the user. Um, and in this was a this um, KKB's probabilistic argumentation frameworks was linked into it. One of the things that we're looking at is, is um, preference handling and how we deal with things like preferences over preferences, as I mentioned. Um, so, so there's, a, there's a, a load of interesting things that we want to want to do. It's on GitHub, um, so you can, you can do your own install if you want to, um, and hopefully it will, it will be available more more widely in terms of um, uh, as a web based web web based service. Um, and. and we have a demo in comma as well. So my conclusions. Um, essentially, what I've tried to argue is, if we're looking at argument accumulation teams, we need to consider the human as well as the agent. All right. So not just computational algorithms, nice, nice little uh, variants of non-monotonic logics. We need to think more what's, what's useful in terms of how people. Um, interact with these things, but also consider the types of role that an agent would play in terms of supporting the individual, the team, etc. And we need to consider all the different plethora of, of methods that we, that we have available to understand what's, what's relevant. And we must then evaluate the real people because we're not necessarily going to know whether or not it will work. Okay. So, um, apologies for overwhelming a bit, but. Uh, Thank you very much.